Welcome to Casual Friday. So I've got various updates on knitting news in my knitting life, as well as project updates and spinning updates. So there's always links down in the description if you want to jump from section to section. So the fall 2019 knit scene magazine just came out. I think yesterday was the official publication date and it's hard to believe <laughs> it's not even July yet and there it's already the fall magazine. So I have an article in this issue on how to understand cable charts. So a lot of people when they learn to read charts they don't really have any trouble with the the single box symbols that have a decrease in it or an increase or, or a twisted stitch, something like that. But they get really thrown by cable symbols which can span multiple stitches and they find them very confusing and how do you tell them apart and how do you tell what's going on. So that's what this article is about. Now typically at some point Interweave will put my technical knitting articles on their blog and you'll it'll show up if you get if you subscribe to knitting daily you'll it'll come in there and you'll, you'll they'll have a link to the article so I haven't seen yet when it's going to be um, on the website so I always keep links to all my articles that I've written for interweave in my rocks rocks group on Ravelry there, the group has something called pages and there are different pages that have links to different things. So some of those are links to my Technique Tuesday videos, some are links to Casual Friday, some are links to my articles, some are links to my old Ask a Knitter column that I had in the Ravelry newsletter this week in Ravelry years ago. So when you go to that group then you can find links to those articles. So as soon as this article is up on the Interweave blog I'll post a link um, for that. So last Saturday I taught two classes in person at the Yarnery in St. Paul and it was really it was really great. I hadn't taught in person in a year. I've been thinking about it. I've been asked to do it and I just haven't done it. I hadn't thought about what sort of class I might teach. And so this was really fun. It was a what they call a pop-up class. There's very little notice for it and it's a, something that can be taught in, in you know a one hour time period. So I, I taught it on the Finchley graft that I did a technique video on maybe a month ago and uh, did a lot of discussion about the history of Kitchener stitch and it's really in the relationship of grafting to other knitting techniques. And it was a lot of fun. So it reminded me how helpful it is for me to watch people learning something in person and how they can interpret an instruction in a way that I hadn't expected or without me saying you should do this or you shouldn't do this they'll naturally do something that may be helpful or may be not helpful. So it's really good for me to do that and um, so I really want to get back into doing more in-person teaching. So I've been talking the past couple of weeks about doing this August sock knit along and I'll be doing this hosting this in my Ravelry group. There's already a thread in there. I'll be announcing next week exactly how the knit along is going to work and how you can prepare to, for it before August and then how things I'm hoping will, will, will operate uh, once we get started on it. But one of the things that came up in the thread people were talking about different types of needles that they use. Some people have never knit a sock, some people have knit lots of socks but want to learn more about better fit and that's really the goal of this knit along is learning how to knit a sock, a custom fit sock that fits a particular person rather than just what are the rules for, for how to knit a generic sock that may or may not fit and if it fits may not fit very well. There is some discussion about different needle types. Now my preference happens to be a 32 inch circular needle for everything I knit. That's just my preference. And so when I'm knitting a small circumference item, I use Magic Loop. And I have been doing some replacement of some of my needles this year because they get so much use. I don't have that many needles and they get a lot of use. And I bought a new interchangeable set of Chow Gu. I bought some of their fixed length circulars and really liked them. And I thought, well, I'm gonna try their interchangeable set and see what I think and I liked, liked them quite a lot and I was kind of surprised 
that they went down all the way down to a size two, a US two, because my old interchangeable set only went down to a size four and anything below that you had to get fixed length. So that was, that was interesting that the chow goo could go down to a size two. Well, somebody was telling me about, well, they were telling the group about chow goo mini and I hadn't really paid attention to that. I was, for some reason I thought mini meant that the tip lengths were shorter, um, but that's not what they are. Mini is an interchangeable set of very, of fine needles. So it comes with a set of, I ordered it and just came yesterday and it has a set of five, of five tips that go all the way down to 1.5 millimeter, which is the triple aught. So there's a triple aught, a double aught, the zero size, US size one, and then US one and a half, which is two and a half millimeters. So they have these little tips in this little case here. And it comes in a little zipper deal like this. And it, come, it comes with a, a needle gauge that goes only up to size three, but it, it covers all the needles that come in this case and then a couple more. It comes with three lengths of cables that a 14 inch, a 22 and a 30. You add 10 inches to that because the tips are each five inch and that tells you you have a 24 inch circular, a 32 or a 40 inch. And um, they're very, very, very little fine cables and they have very fine connectors. So that you have to have a different set because when the tips get so small, that means that the cables have to be smaller than they would be for the larger needles. So it comes with three needles. I bought two extras because I like a 32 inch circular and I also don't like having to swap my tips out, just make myself a set of needles. Then it came with this and this did not, this was not something that came in my other set that I bought. So it opens up and it's got a little, oops, it's got little things inside of it. So there's a little envelope and it has these miniature T-pins. Now the regular interchangeable set I had came with regular T-pins, just like I use for blocking my knitting. So it came with T-pins that were just like that. This one comes with tiny little T-pins because again, the connectors are much tinier. So the holes are tinier. It also comes with a pair of these are uh, needle stoppers. So if you need to take the tips off, and leave the stitches on the cable, then you can screw this on the ends to keep all of the stitches from flying off. And then it comes with two, I didn't see these at first because they're so tiny. They're little, if I can even hold it in my hand. They're, ah, they're little, little tiny, I can't hold it without it flying out of my hands. It's a little tiny connector so that you can connect uh, two cables together so you can make an even longer circular needle if you want. So those little, and it's got a couple of stitch markers, a handful of stitch markers in here. So they keep all that in a little zipper bag and then in this case. And then the other thing it came with that I didn't come with a, the bigger set was this little rubbery heart. And that it's a gripper thing so that when you are tightening your cables, you have, you can use this to, to keep hold of the cable while you're tightening things. It's a nice set if you are a sock knitter and you use different kinds of fingering weight yarns because fingering weight yarns, fingering weight yarn is kind of a broad category. There are actually quite a, a, a range of thicknesses in fingering weight yarns, which are used often for socks. I usually know exactly what needle type I'm going to need in a, with a particular sock yarn if I've used that sock yarn before. But if I'm using a new brand and it doesn't have a similar yardage to one that I've used before, I, if it has a lot more yardage, I'm gonna need a finer needle. I'm gonna need more stitches per inch. If it has less yardage, that means the yarn is thicker and I'm probably gonna need fewer stitches per inch, so bigger needle. So if you are, are struggling to know what needle size or you really wanna get the right fabric for socks, uh, that this is a nice thing where you can, you know, swap needles out to see which one is, is going to work the best. So I'm going to answer a couple of questions and then I'll give you an update on my serviceable sweater project. So the first question is, where do I get my t-shirt? So this one says I'm a simple woman and it's got a wine glass, pair of flip flops, some dog paws and a ball of yarn. This particular one, I think just showed up in my Facebook feed and I just impulsively clicked on it. And then a few days later, I had a shirt in the mail. But I like, when I go to a new yarn shop or if I'm, if I'm doing a shop hop type of thing, 
I always look to see if the shop has a knitting related t-shirts because all, all winter long I'm wearing sweaters that I knit but in the summer I'm not wearing sweaters very often unless it's like a linen top or something. Um, so I wear a lot of knitting related t-shirts and I've just accumulated them over the past 10 or 15 years. Sometimes they're in a yarn shop and sometimes it's somebody local or it's a, somebody with an Etsy shop but maybe it's local and it's in a local yarn shop or it's something that the yarn shop themselves had printed up. Uh, sometimes somebody will mention it uh, maybe on Ravelry and somebody will say, oh, I got this really uh, funny shirt or I'll see somebody, I'll see one at the, a marketplace if there's like a yarn event, like a festival or some other sort of knitting event. A lot of times there'll be somebody in the marketplace who's selling t-shirts. So I just accumulate them and I never pay attention to where I get them. So I just keep my eye out and I grab them when I see them. So this came up in my Ravelry group the other day somebody who was knitting cables was wondering if the cable needle that you're slipping the stitches on when you're doing a cable crossing if it's better to have a cable needle that's slightly larger than the the project needles or slightly smaller and i will say slightly smaller to a lot smaller is typically what I do and it kind of depends on the type of cable needle if you need to let go of it if it's too much smaller it could just end up sliding out um, but it's smaller is better and the reason is is that when you are working a cable you have let's say a basic cable with a few stitches crossing another few stitches like that some of the stitches get put on the cable needle and then they have to cross over you're working things out of order so they have to stretch all the way across each other in order to be knit and that puts some stress on those stitches or it causes some tension and you need some slack available to allow that to happen so if you take out any slack that there is between stitches by inserting a larger needle through those stitches you take all the slack away that gives you no nothing extra to work with when you're crossing the stitches over so a third the third question i'm going to answer is one that was asked someone asked me i think yesterday or the day before she's working on one of my patterns i think it's the translated fingerless mitt pattern which has a twisted stitch ribbing so it's knit through the back loop purl and so the knits are all twisted and in the pattern, I don't tell you how, how to cast on. I happen to use a long tail cast on. And she was wondering, she wanted to make some modifications. She wanted to turn them into gloves for one thing, but she was thinking about using a tubular cast on and wanted to know if it would work. And the question she had was, what would it be like aesthetically? And secondly, how would it affect the stretch? So she had some very specific and good questions. And these are the questions that I would have if I was considering doing something like this. Now I haven't done it before, but these are the questions that I would have. So she knows how to do a tubular cast on and she knows what the issues might be. And so the way to go with something like that, particularly if you are wanting to modify things, you are learning more and more by doing this. And this has put you on the road to designing your own items. But these are the kinds of questions that you can answer yourself. If you know how to do something, but just don't know how it's going to turn out, that's the time when you should swatch and see for yourself what happens. She was thinking, well, I don't want to reinvent the wheel, but the, the thing is, a lot of times I have questions like this and I'm thinking, I wonder if this would work. And so I try it out and I'm like, oh, that didn't quite work. That's almost what I wanted. Well, what if I do this? Oh no, that's too futsy. So I try a few different things and see if I can get what it was that was in my head to work. And while I'm doing that, I learn an incredible amount about things that I didn't expect to learn. So if you have the ability to figure out what you need to do to get your answer, my suggestion is to do it and see what happens. Because even if the answer to your, your original question is, oh, that was not a good idea. The side benefit is that you'll probably learn some things that you didn't expect, that you didn't anticipate were going to show up. And that is going to add to your foundation of knitting knowledge in ways that you didn't expect. That's one of the, the great things that, that unexpected 
surprise when I am thinking that I am doing something in order to find out this answer and then I find out three other things that I did not anticipate. I am almost done with this. I have all of the seaming done. The last few things that I need to do is I want to put some ribbon on the back sides of the button bands and which means I'm going to have to put button holes in the ribbon that goes on the button hole side uh, and then I need to sew on the buttons. Um, I also need to wash and block it and I need to weave in the ends. And there, there are a few other little things that Oh, as I put it together, I was like, oh, I want to fix this. I want to fix that. Uh, I, the, the bottom edge of this collar right here, I want it, the point does, is just kind of sticking out. I want to kind of a, uh, pull that in and attach it to the button band. The big mystery with this sweater was how, how was I going to knit the collar and how is it going to work out? Because the instructions for the collar were, were, were basically missing from the pattern. There was one line of instruction. There was a, a line of instruction for transitioning from the sleeve to the cuff where I you switch to smaller needles and then you do a bunch of decreases. But then the next instruction was to was the last line of the collar. It was repeat the last three rows until two stitches remain and bind off. There was a, a bunch missing. There was some a printer's error where uh, the rest of the information about the cuff was missing and most of the information about the collar was missing. So what I knew, what I assumed was that the original instructions started at one edge with a cup at one point of the v-neck with two stitches and gradually increased up to the back probably was knit straight across the back and then as it came down this side of the v-neck was decreased and it sounded like they were shaping done every third row so this is this is a v-shape and so there would have been um if on the increased side you would have had an increase here and then three rows later increase there increase there and that's that's how you get that v-shape and typically with a shawl collar, if you unfold the collar, then really what you end up with is that the collar will, will fill the space of the V in a straight line going up. And the way I knit this was a little bit wider than that. I looked at how much fabric was uh, lost with the decreases for the V-neck. And then I looked at, well, if I replace that much, is that collar as wide as I would like it to be? Because one of the things that I don't like about shawl collars is when the back of the neck, it does not actually come up my neck. Because I live in Minnesota, and when I'm sitting around in the house, I want my neck to be warm, and I want that collar to come all the way up. So I made this a little bit wider than it probably would, would have been knit. And the other thing that I did was I didn't start with two, go all the way around and end with two. Instead, because I really wasn't sure what was going on in the back, I knit two, I knit both of them starting at the bottom with two stitches and knit them up to the neck. And that way, if the neck wasn't fitting right, I could rip them out. And so what I wanted to be able to do was I needed to be able to join the live stitches at the back of the neck. And I had a couple of different ideas for how I was going to do that or I, how I could do that. So one of the things that I could have done was graft it right down the middle. And at first I didn't want to do that because if it wasn't going to work, then I'd have to undo the graft and rip things back and redo it. So my thought was I would do a three needle bind off and I would do a specific type of three needle bind off that was flat and that was flat on one side and then on the other side would look like a garter stitch graft. And so the, the idea was I would do the three needle bind off on this side and then when the collar was flipped over it would just look like garter stitch on this side. Well the first mistake I made was that <laughs> I, I did the three needle bind off from this side and so so, which was wrong. I didn't want the chain edge to show there. So I took that out and then I redid it from this side part way. And then I realized it wasn't looking the way I'd expected on this side. It didn't really look quite like garter stitch. And I realized that because I'd made the two collars exactly the same, 
when I sewed them on, I had to sew them in reverse because I have some short rows right around the edge of the collar here when it hits the shoulder. And so I had to have the, the, sh the short rows on the outside on both of these, which meant that one of them had to be flipped over when I sewed it on. So that meant when I had come up to the middle, one of the edges had a knit side showing and one had a pearl side showing and I needed them both to, to be knits on one side and both be pearls on the other. Well, then I couldn't remember whether I needed knits on, on the side where I was doing the bind off or pearls. So I had to go look up an article that I wrote a year ago in order to remember how to do that technique. So finally, on the third try, I did the three needle bind off all the way across. I flipped it over and yes, there was a garter stitch ridge there, but because it wasn't a true graft and the way this three needle bind off worked, that place where the three needle bind off was is sort of in a valley with the rest of the garter stitch coming up. So it was very obvious and I didn't, I didn't want to draw attention to it. And so I, I was convinced that the collar fit okay by that time. So I ripped out the three needle bind off one more time and I decided to graft it. But before I could graft it, I had to rip out one more row so that instead of the two edges looking exactly the same, they were opposite each other again. So I ended up taking out two rows total in the back of the center, but there was plenty because I'd had uh, short rows in here. So I think it was, I did three, three tries. And the, and the fourth was a barely started when I realized I needed to rip another row out. And so it was really the fifth try when I grafted. And another reason I didn't really want to graft was because there is a half stitch offset when you are grafting two pieces that are knit separately. So you're at the bind off edge for both and you graft them toward each other. You have to offset them so that the graft lines up well, that causes the edges to be half stitch off. And so I was a little, a little worried about that, but I think I'm going to be able to weave in um, this tail here so that it's not uh, noticeable at all. So I actually think the graft looks nice. At the back here, it looks, you know, very, very smooth. Another person who decided to knit their version of the serviceable sweater had a question about how the sleeves were set in to the sweater. Because the, the way that the, that the front and the back are proportioned is not 50% in the front with 50% in the back. Even when you take out the button bands, typically the way a cardigan works in these days is that you have the same number, this, the same amount of fabric in the front as you do in the back, just like with a pullover. And then, but to make it a cardigan, you split it down the front and then you add the button band. So if it's an inch and a half button band, the front ends up being about an inch and a half larger than the back, which is fine. This sweater is set up so that even when you take the button bands off, there, there are more, more fabric in the front um, than there is in the back. And so that means that the side seam is set a little, it's not centered directly under on, on the side. It, it's a little further back. And so the instructions for setting in the sleeve are to line up the underarm seam for the, for the sleeve an inch forward of that. And I think that is to place it directly centered down the side. What wasn't clear was where the sleeve cap should be centered at the top. Originally, I thought, well, it would be centered over the, the shoulder seam. And the shoulder seam, because of shoulder shaping, is actually a little bit further um, back on the shoulder. And so I was thinking that it was kind of rotate it a little bit. And that's a dressmaking technique to kind of rotate the sleeve because your arms come forward. So that kind of makes sense. But it didn't wasn't specifically saying that. And so in the first sleeve, I did that. I centered the top of the cap right over the seam. And then on the second one, I thought, you know, I wonder if it's just that they want, you know, the center of the, the sleeve to be at the center of the body but the sleeve cap should still be at the top of the sleeve. So for the second one, I did it that way and I can't tell a difference when I tried it on. In fact, I tried it on and then I couldn't remember which one I had done first. So I didn't, I wouldn't have been able to take one of them out and 
correct it for that purpose and know what, know what I had done wrong or done differently. So this hasn't been washed or blocked yet. And this mistake rib wants to pull in. So I think once I wash it and block it and the fabric has relaxed and it's dried, I'll try it on again and see if I can see any difference in the sleeve at all. Knitting is stretchy, so it's, it's more forgiving than woven fabrics would be. So I think some of the dressmaker techniques that were used or sometimes are used in the sweaters may not uh, be practical. They might be something that a really fastidious uh, knitter who also knows dressmaking might want to make sure that they do because that's how they're used to doing things. But I don't know that it actually makes a difference. And this is one of the reasons I'm trying these antique sweaters and, and looking at these different construction approaches is to see if that's just what they're used to doing and so that's why they did it or if it actually makes a difference in the fit or if it's a combination of what they're used to plus the fashion of that time period, which is not the fashion of our time period. So on Mother's Day weekend in May, I went to Shepherd's Harvest. I did a whole video on that. And my friend, I saw my friend Celeste there and I wanted to buy a fleece from the fleeces that had been judged. So these were fleeces that were chosen by the shepherds to be a, a quality fleece and they would have been skirted so the poop removed and vegetable matter would have been removed. So these would be pretty clean fleeces. They're still raw fleeces, but they were pretty clean. And so I, but I didn't know anything about how to pick one out just because something had a ribbon on it didn't mean anything to me. And I didn't understand the pricing was so wildly different from one fleece to another. So she had her eye on CV, a CVM fleece, so California Variegated Mutant. And she said, well, it's too expensive for me to just buy in my own, but I'd split it with you or I'd split it with someone. And I said, well, I'll split it with you. So we bought it, she took it home, and then she had knee surgery. And a couple of weeks ago, she was feeling well enough to have visitors, so I've been going over once a week for the afternoon and, um, and knitting. And so when I went over the first time, we, she took the fleece out and we laid it on her living room floor. And she said, well, no, this part is probably the head and this is the butt. And, and so, and, and we laid it all out and then I just split it down the center. And then she bagged up hers and then she got out. She told me she was going to show me how to clean the fleece. And she told me, you know, the equipment and I bought some, but I hadn't brought it over. But we washed a portion of my fleece at her house so I could see how it was done. So today, this morning, I did another, I did it myself in my own bathroom with my own uh, equipment. And so let me show you what the equipment is that I'm using. So it's one of these three tray kitty litter boxes. So there's two, the, the dark blue ones are two solid trays and there's still water in there from this morning. Um, and then there's this tray right here, which is meant for sifting kitty litter, but it's also great for draining wet fleece out. So into one tub goes some very hot water uh, with a little bit of dish detergent. Um, you don't want any suds or anything. You just kind of swirl it around. And then we, you fill up this, not tightly, just loosely. This prob I probably did about seven ounces of fleece in here. And I didn't fill it up all the way. I just didn't know how everything was gonna work on my own. But essentially what I did was I filled this up. The, the tub, what, I filled up the tub with water. It was 140 degrees. Um, which is what our hot water heater is set at, but we, we had this, we remodeled when I was pregnant with my second child and they, they put in these things in the hot water taps that control how hot the water can come out so it can't scald. So the water that comes out of my tap is only 111 degrees. So I was pouring, I had to pour some boiling water in it to make sure it was hot enough. Celeste says she just uses Dawn dish detergent. And now I did a video on Dawn dish detergent a year ago when I was learning to spin because it was driving me crazy when people would say, oh, you have to use original Dawn 
Typically when people are saying original Dawn, they mean the Dawn that is not concentrated. So sometimes it's called simply clean. Sometimes it's called non ultra. I looked up all the ingredients <laughs> and ultra Dawn has the same ingredients that that the non-concentrated Dawn dish, uh, dish detergent had. It just has less water in it, so you don't need to use as much of it. And that's the thing you have to be careful of is if it's Ultra Dawn, then you can use half as much as a, as the what people call original Dawn. So it doesn't matter what color or scent you use. The important thing is that it doesn't have enzymes in it because enzymes like to digest protein. Analyze enzymes will digest like starches and then protease enzymes will digest proteins and since wool is a protein fiber you don't want to have a, a detergent with that kind of enzyme in it when you are washing your fleece. We shop at Costco all the time and so the Dawn this is only sold at Costco but this is this is called Dawn Ultra Platinum Advanced Power. This one has enzymes in it so, and you, you can look it up on their website and you can see, see the ingredients in it. But Dawn and Dawn Ultra are really the same thing and they're just different concentrations. So I'll just show you a little bit of video that I recorded while I was washing the fleece. So I have two buckets here, one's empty, one has some very hot water that's in the, it's above 140 right now. I'm gonna put a couple of tablespoons of uh, Ultra Dawn in there. This is a concentrated version of Dawn. There's no enzymes. There's nothing to worry about. And then it needs, I'm just going to stir it around a little bit. I don't want a lot of suds. So now I have this basket of fleece. It's the, it's the, uh, the sieve or strainer part of this kitty litter box system. So I've got less than eight ounces of wool in here, somewhere between six and eight ounces. And now I'm going to put it in the kitty litter box. And then I'm going to use this just to push the wool down inside. And then I'm going to cover it with the other lid just to help retain some of that heat in there. And I'm going to let it sit for about 20 minutes and then I will rinse it. Okay, I'm going to, it's been 15 minutes. So I'm going to start getting the other tub ready. So our, our water is only 111 degrees. 112 degrees. So I have some boiling water. Let's see how that works. That works well. I want it to be about the same temperature. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to lift this up and let it drain a little. I'll let it drain for a few minutes. I'm going to give it another 15 minutes and then I'll decide if I need to do another rinse. This temperature is about the same. That doesn't actually look too bad. It just looks like it's 
probably lanolin, but I'm just going to stick this in here. And on there. I'm just going to let it drain for a bit. Now what I didn't show you was what I did after after the fleece finished draining. So what I did because when you when you pull it out it basically is kept this rectangular shape. It's wet and it's in this rectangular shape from the from the um, bin that it was in. I just dumped it out onto a towel and I folded one end of the towel over the top of it and the other end of the towel over it stomped on it a little bit like I would if I was trying to get excess water out of a sweater just but very carefully I don't want to rub or anything then I unfolded that and then I just put it on one of those mesh sweater racks I'm just going to let it dry and see how it does overnight and then this weekend I'll do another uh, batch of it I'm not going to do it in my bathroom though because of that temperature control on the faucet. <laughs> so I'm going to um, do it down in my laundry room instead. I think I'll, I get hotter water down there and uh, probably still have to supplement with a little bit of boiling water, but probably not as much. I had to use uh, quite a lot of boiling water and that probably took me more time than anything else. Because uh, really, once it's just soaking, you just let it soak there for 20 minutes, and then you move it to the other um, bin of water. But I was spending a lot of time boiling water to make sure that I, the water was hot enough when I was transferring it from one, um, from the wash to the rinse, and then to the second rinse. That's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.